Welcome. Uh, we have Rudy here showing us how to leverage documentation power for better APIs. Give him some clap. Hello. So, hello, I'm Rudy. I'm working at Criteo, a company that delivers personal, personalized ads at scale. Um, my team <coughs> is building monitoring tool for our large software and ad hardware inventory. And sometime, uh, sometimes ago in, in this team, we decided <coughs> to make monitoring as a service and start to experiment different ideas around web service and browsable APIs. So this presentation gives a glimpse of, of what we have done. <coughs> and this is a joint work with my colleague, Huglo Robot, which is there, and me. I'm sorry, okay, I forgot some of the... So, what is a browsable ap API? <coughs> Obviously, it's composed of two words, the browsable words. So, probably it's related to a browser. And more importantly, um, it's related to exploration and experimentation. And I will uh, add to that more later. And there is a word API. Uh, I will quote a formal talk. So an API is a kind of contract. Uh, it can be very explicit, like if you're uh, declaring a Swagger specification file, or it can be implicit, like in the documentation. Uh, the contract, it defines the valid use of the service that is linked to the API. All the operation you can do in this, with this service um, and also what are the valid inputs uh, for operation in, in the service. So why is it interesting? Um, because it brings a lot of feature for your service. Um, so the first feature I will speak about is <coughs> why we rely on the documentation uh, to uh, describe the API. Um, then I will speak about a uh, basic feature that you have in Browsable API. So the first basic feature is the explorability. It means that you can go to the API and ask what the operations are possible on this API. So here you have a view of an, ap of an API with different operations. Uh, and then you can just click on an operation and you see the documentation of that operation, the parameter types, and what are the possible results. And then, more than that, you can play with an operation. Uh, so you have to type the input of the operation and call it, and so you can uh, see what are, it's the response and explore the behavior of this uh, operation. But still, typing the input, like a JSON input, can be difficult. So probably can do something better. Another really important feature of um, an API uh, is to enforce the validation of the input on the, of the input and the outputs. Um, by the way, this talk focuses on the JSON inputs. Um, you don't want an operation to be used in a, an adapter that way, that's why you should uh, validate uh, all the inputs of, the, of your service. Like if a list is transmitted instead of a uh, string, nobody knows how the, call will, how the code will um, behave in that case. And even for valid JSON input, um, you may want to have a conversion between the JSON input and between your Python types. Okay, this one is an obvious feature. 
like I said before, it can be uh, really painful to enter uh, JSON data because it's a verbose format. Um, so having forms uh, make you save times and it bring client side uh, input validation on the table. And another really interesting feature is that uh, you have that kind of API contracts when you have your service implementation and yes, you want to be sure that they perfectly match. So um, that would be really cool to just ask for automatic tests for uh, checking that they match. And I will also present uh, other feature that uh, makes uh, Brosable API more user friendly. And last, uh, just to mention it, uh, you may want to generate, even if you use the doc, uh, more formal um, specification contract like in Swagger because Swagger has a lot of amazing features that you can let, later use. So, and this is the plan of the talk, the talk in fact. So, I'm starting now. So, imagine you want to add a new function uh, to your, uh, your API. What do you do? Okay, it's easy. You document the functions and you add the publish decorator on it. So this decorator, it will res register the function uh, as an operation in the API. The function will be left unmodified, so you can still use it uh, as before uh, when the, operator, the decorator was not there. And behind the scenes, the function will be wrapped in the API uh, where all the data about a HTTP will be handled. Um, so, how is it done? Um, docu documentation uh, will be parsed um, so that uh, we have information about input, output, and uh, exceptions. Um, this gives you uh, type trans type constraint about inputs, outputs, and possible zero, and also the signature of the functions give you default value for inputs. So here we have type constraints, that's what's in, in the red boxes. Uh, type constraints, they are more than just type names. Uh, they can be parameterized for iterable and mapping types. Like here, we have a parameterized list uh, that, that is parameterized by my type B. Um, or it can also contain several uh, type names, like the first parameter, it's either an int or a string. Um, and from that type constraints, uh, we can find all the O, all the input should be validated and translated from JSON data structure to Python object. For that, we convert uh, that type constraint to a JSON schema. So for those that, for people that don't really know what is JSON and JSON formats, um, JSON object can be seen as a subset of the built-in Python tabs. So often the conversion between the two is free. Uh, but for your services, you still need to um, do this. You, you may need to do additional validation, and this is done by a JSON schema. So, what is JSON schema? A JSON schema uh, it describes uh, the structure of the expected uh, uh, JSON objects, like its types or its minimum value. What it, contain, what it contains, uh, the, like the name of the field, the one that are optional, so it really describes uh, what you are expecting as an input. Um, and there are also situations where you want uh, real conversion to happen, so you have like um, uh, JSON dictionary and you want it to be converted to your own Python class. Um, 
So for these two cases, when you want to have additional validation and custom conversion, we introduce uh, two classes that helps to attach the conversion and the JSON schema uh, to your regular class. So from that, uh, we are able to retrieve a JSON schema from uh, any type constraint. So all of the validation and the conversion happened. But when the, uh, the service is called and the input are received, there's a first a validation. For most basic validation, we rely on the type constraint in the documentation. And for more complex one, um, we rely on this JSON schema. Uh, so there's a library called JSON schema that you can use to validate any, um, any data structure with your JSON schema. Um, after that validation, um, there is the conversion, conversion step um, that is either implicit for most basic type or uncrafted uh, using the from JSON classes. And then the real function is called and from that, there can be two outcomes. You can have an exception. And so what we do is that we check that the exceptions um, is uh, respecting the contract. If it's not, uh, it, the content of the exception is hidden because we don't want uh, the user of the service to see if, uh, anything that is not uh, accepted by the contract. And at last, if we get a result uh, from that function call, uh, we uh, validate it uh, based on its type. So what else can we do with JSON schema? After all, it's a standard. So you can use JSON editor. It's able to use a JSON schema uh, to generate a form, which is also an editor. It's able to validate the form and give you back the uh, validate JSON value. So you just have to plug in a call to JSON editor in your HTML format template, and you have a cool feature for almost nothing. So here you have a, a view of uh, what you had before. Uh, you had to type the JSON content in the play with me text area. And now, using JSON uh, editor, you just have a form, so it's uh, really easy to, uh, to um, uh, create an input. And note that there are, uh, there are similar features in Django REST framework, but you should also, in this case, declare things manually, like the serializer for the form, just like uh, you have to write a JSON for uh, schema here. So what else can we do with JSON schema? Um, I don't know if you know a package named Hypothesis. Um, it's uh, a package that helps you to do property-based testing. Um, so it's composed of strategies that are able to uh, generate a random inputs uh, for uh, many um, uh, usual types. And it's a really a fantastic tool. I encourage you to use it. Um, so let's add the generation strategy for JSON schema. With that, uh, we can generate tests to verify that all the operations of uh, our service respect the contract, the contract described by the documentation. So here, I've uh, put two examples. So I've taken a, a, a valid code that uh, respect uh, the contract of the API, and I've modified it. So in the first case, um, I changed the code just before it was raising an, an exception. And I added a, a type error, like I, I had an internal string. And from the automatic tests, we have uh, this message where 
first, um, the type error is discovered and uh, is uh, uh, shown to the developer uh, with a, a proper stack trace. And second, uh, the, the programmer is also warned that one of the exceptions that uh, is described in the contract uh, is never, never occur with this operation. So it shows that uh, the, what is described in the documentation could be outdated, for instance. And then I've put another example um, where uh, I modified the valid code and make it return uh, uh, a bad value, like a, a list of string for a function that is, is expected to return something else. And so what we see is that it's also uh, de uh, detected automatically. So uh, we have something that uh, is able to take your whole API and automatically check that what you have described in the documentation is on par with the current implementation, uh, which is a really cool feature. So what can I do next with JSON schema? I don't know, we stop it there. Um, so we already have an easy way to enter JSON uh, with forms. Uh, can we have something useful to visual, visualize the JSON response? Uh, so taking inspiration from Django REST framework that already does the coloring of the JSON response, we decided to go further and uh, to add something that we called uh, pretty view. Uh, so a pretty view, it helps you to define custom visualization of uh, the JSON response. Um, so here, for instance, so you have the row view above and the pretty view uh, in the lower part of the screen. And you can see that uh, uh, the JSON contains a timestamp. And in the pretty view, the timestamp is converted directly to a, a human readable date. Um, and there's also another example when you have uh, an integer value in uh, the JSON and it has a particular semantic and the, the pretty view is able to show that semantic. So here it's uh, the value zero which is uh, an okay, okay flag. Uh, so it's really uh, make the, um, the JSON response easier to read for uh, humans. Um, and uh, an, another thing that we added to the, um, to the pretty view is the ability to add extra information. Like here, the pretty view says something about active downtimes that are not in the initial uh, JSON response. And moreover, it add a link near that extra information. And uh, that link, which we call uh, an input link, it's a link that is able to go to another operation and prefill all the information in the form. Um, so you can navigate between different features in the, um, the API and you don't have to tip anything. So here when you click on the red link, you will go to the operation page, uh, to some another operation page, and every field will be already pre-filled. Mm, so what's next? Uh, we plan to open source um, all the things that uh, we presented there. Um, so you can watch the uh, Criteo GitHub repository. Uh, we will add the, the different contribution there. Um, you, we will also contribute to hypothesis with the JSON schema strategy. And um, uh, one thing that we didn't do and we 
would be very interesting. It's to support enum natively because it's a really um, interesting uh, type place. Um, and to integrate more with uh, PyTest, um, because the, the thing that I show to you that uh, gives you uh, like a diagnostic for your, uh, your API, like with the warning and the error about mismatch between the contract and the implementation, uh, currently you have to run it uh, by hand and it will be better if it, we be integra integrated in a standard uh, testing uh, package. Then there is the Swagger spec generation. So we already have a lot of cool features, so why would we want that? Uh, because it, Swagger has the ability to generate a code, a client code library. That means you code uh, your uh, service in Python, and then you want people to have automatic access in Java. Like you just write the Swagger file, and uh, it will generate the client for you in Java. So that's really a good thing. So if you have to um, only keep uh, um, a simple message from this presentation, uh, Posable API, they are really interesting stuff. Um, because they are very user friendly and uh, you can uh, discover the content and explore and test and it's uh, very good. Um, the documentation and the types, uh, they can be really used to uh, add a lot of feature to your uh, services. So here I give uh, some example with uh, the feature I present, but there's a lot uh, more things to do. Um, and also as a conclusion, JSON and JSON schema, uh, they are very handy, they are standard, there are a lot of tool, tools around them. So uh, don't hesitate to use them. Uh, um, I think it will help you to easily have new features uh, in your code. And that's all, if you have questions. Questions? Thank you for coming. <laughs>